Okay, so let's start. So, uh, well, good evening, everyone, and thanks for um, joining this uh, new uh, lecture. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of, um, of having him as a speaker, uh, Xavi Alameda Pineda. And, uh, well, I had the pleasure of, uh, well, I already know Xavi for more than 10 years. He's been also in my group for about two years. Uh, and, uh, well, it was always a pleasure to, uh, to talk to him and to, uh, to follow his uh, career as a researcher. Um, he's, uh, I would say he's one of the few truly multimodal persons in the sense that he's been um, uh, doing things at the crossroads of uh, machine learning, computer vision, audio processing, and he was he, he's, he's, he was using this for behavior analysis, human robot interaction, and other things. Um, he's been now um, uh, quite an, uh, an let's say up and coming person in the multimedia community. So he's been the program chair of ACM Multimedia. It's a future general chair of ACM Multimedia. He has given a, a keynote to the, this year ACM Multimedia. So I'm I'm sure he is now uh, the things that he has to say are quite quite interesting and of of important relevance. So Chavi, looking forward to your uh, to your talk. All right. Um, thanks, Nico, for the for this very nice introduction. And uh, thanks to um, Aida for the invitation. It's uh, really nice to uh, to be here um, to share with you um, a few thoughts and, and work that we have done on um, on audiovisual representation learning with probabilistic uh, methods. So uh, I am the um, leader of the robot learn team at INRIA, which is also a team um, with the University Grenoble Alpes and CNRS. And uh, the research that I will discuss today has been done uh, in collaboration with several people, as I will mention along the lecture, but I thank them in advance already and also was funded by um, a few research bodies, um, in particular with the uh, S2020 Spring project, um, a few minor projects, uh, and then the uh, local AI Institute here in uh, Grenoble. So uh, in the team, we are interested in, um, sorry, I don't know why this is not moving. Okay, sorry. Um, we are interested in um, developing machine learning uh, models, methods, and, and algorithms that would allow um, like an, an embodied agent, a robot, to actually navigate in the broad sense in, uh, in such uh, social environments or environments populated with uh, humans. So for this, we are mainly using um, audio and, and video uh, because the sensors are, of course, quite mature and um, they capture uh, most of um, the cues that uh, we humans use to communicate and to uh, interact. And um, just uh, a couple of things um, that I would like to mention about audio and, and video and why is this interesting to fuse uh, these two modalities is because they are quite complementary in some sense and of a uh, very different nature, right? For instance, audio, let's say, has a quite wide field of hearing uh, but you can only exploit this successfully when the sources are active, right? In a sense, um, as long as there is a light, um, visual sources are all, always active, right? So um, they, they, we are always reflecting light. Uh, the problem is that the cameras have a limited field of view, right? So only these, these two things, they, they already tell that these two modalities are quite different. And why are we focusing on unsupervised representation learning? It is simply because it's very complicated to gather large amounts of data uh, and to annotate it in these kind of scenarios. Right? Um, so this means that uh, we would like to develop methods that basically prepare to, for a quick adaptation that are able to adapt. Um, using, let's say, unsupervised domain adaptation, right? Getting prepared with meta uh, learning. So, so we are in this, uh, let's say, part of the, um, of the, flat, of the landscape uh, or the large domain of uh, machine learning. But in particular, one may wonder why we would like to, um, why we focus uh, part of our research 
in probabilistic learning. Um, so probabilistic learning aims to uh, estimate a bunch of parameters uh, of a data distribution, this p theta, which is the learned distribution, that will approximate whatever complex data distribution that you have uh, on, on the from the data, right? And of course, if you learn this properly, you could sample that. But more importantly, what is very interesting with these probabilistic models is that once you have learned one of them, you can combine it with another and maybe learn the second one or learn the two of them jointly using always this um, general principle of maximum likelihood, right? So there are going to be a few equations uh, in this presentation. Uh, this is mainly because that's my way through science. So that's how I share uh, my experience and my findings. Uh, I will try to explain them and detail them when, them when necessary. If you have questions, um, even if they are after the lecture, don't hesitate to, to drop an email and I will do my best to, to answer them. So uh, let us start with something that you might be familiar with, which is this uh, causal flavor divergence. Right? This is um, this is comparing two distributions, um, and it has several properties that are interesting. One is that it is not negative. Uh, second property is that uh, this causal flavor divergence is zero, even only if the two distributions are the same. And finally, this is a non-symmetric. Um, measure, right? So that's one of the reasons we call these a divergence. So um, these colorly divergence will appear, I mean, it's a very important, uh, it's a very important concept and will appear uh, in the presentation, but most importantly, it's at the very foundation of the maximum likelihood formulation. Why? Because when when you write down like the minimization of the colorly divergence between the data and your model, this Petita, this actually boils down to the very well-known maximum likelihood uh, principle, right? So if you ever wonder where this comes from or how you can interpret this maximum likelihood, you can also interpret it as some sort of alignment between your data distribution and uh, your model Petita, right? So, um, this is all fine uh, when you have, let's say, um, simple distributions. You just write down the maximum likelihood, you take the derivative and you get your formula. But this happens only for very simple models. And we might wonder what to do when you have, for instance, latent variables, right? So a latent variable S is a variable that is not observed directly, but has a certain relationship with your observed variable X, right? And you can always write the, uh, likely, the log likelihood of x, right, as the sum of these two terms, right, that you can see here on the slide. And here we will different, we will make the difference between um, several cases depending on what happens ex precisely to this calvary labor divergence that you have on the right. So if you are able to compute exactly this uh, posterior probability of s given x you can set this arbitrary Q of S distribution to this probability. And if you can do that, of course, as we said, this color of divergence will be zero. Right? And this actually gives what we uh, usually refer to as the exact EM. Uh, EM stands for expectation maximization algorithm. And this is the case, for instance, for Gaussian mixture models, for like the Kalman system or the linear dynamical system. Uh, it's also the case for HMM with a bunch of observation distribution, right? Um, so this happens for, um, let's say, models that have a relatively simple posterior distribution of S given X. Uh, but very quickly, when we start making things a bit more complex, this doesn't happen anymore. And one problem that you might encounter is that even if you can write a formula for the posterior distribution, it is actually computationally too complex. Right, so you cannot use it in practice, and in those cases, you can simplify the problem by factorizing the posterior distribution into the product of two subdistributions, let's say, and then uh, again estimating them by minimizing this uh, this scale divergence. But you will never get it to zero, right? Because getting it to zero means that you will be using the exact posterior distribution. Uh, but as we said, this is too complex. 
And then another thing that can happen is that you cannot even write this posterior distribution. Okay. Uh, so in that case, what you one of the things that you could do is to approximate uh, this posterior distribution and set this arbitrary QS to belong to a certain family of distributions. And now you need to estimate this uh, parameters fee, right? This Q fee with parameters fee. Uh, and this is what this give, boils down basically to one of the families of uh, very well-known and supervised probabilistic methods, which are the variational order code. So, um, okay, this is a very nice, but uh, maybe not non-exhaustive, um, let's say, taxonomy of uh, models and algorithms. But maybe one question that you are asking yourselves is, why would we like latent variables if they are so cumbersome? Right. So uh, I give here two examples of tasks for which a latent variable can be very useful, but there are plenty of others. And uh, so on the left, you can have speech, you have speech enhancement, and we will be actually discussing a lot of, uh, of this today. And this uh, task uh, starts, let's say, from a noisy uh, speech signal that you can see in green, right? Which is a combination of a clean signal, which is a signal you're interested in, of course, plus some noise. And what you want to do here is to recover the clean speech signal, which is the latent variable here, from the noisy mixture. And then, of course, you will send it to your ASR and LLM or whatever you want to do with this uh, estimate of the clean speaking. On the right, you have a tracking problem where, of course, you will have, uh, let's say, uh, instantaneous detections at every frame that come from whatever object detector you want, you want to use. But these are noisy. They do not really describe exactly the true position of the source, which is a, of the ball, which is a latent value. Right. So, of course, maybe uh, in this case of a green ball with a very nice background, um, this is probably a soft issue. But if now you start thinking of tracking persons uh, with a cluttered background and so forth and so on, then, of course, the detector is not that performant. Right. So then you need something to infer uh, this latent bias. And once, uh, so actually to formulate a problem um, with, uh, with latent variables, you need to do two things. First, uh, define a prior of your latent variable is p theta of s and a likelihood of the observed variable x given s. And then in, if you cannot use the exact posterior, which is going to be the case at least today and in many, many other cases, you have to select how you will approximate your posterior distribution with whatever q of uh, phi and phi belonging to a certain part. So that's the first thing which is, let's say, a model definition. And then the second part is like doing learning and inference. The learning is usually achieved by maximizing what is called the evidence lower bound, right? And then once you have done that, you take the posterior uh, distribution, the approximation of the posterior distribution, and you can try to find the most likely um, value of the latent variable given a new observation, right? And that would be that we refer to that usually as the inference step. All right, so let us focus a little bit more on speech enhancement because that's gonna be uh, the uh, application for the first half of the talk. And um, so as I said, uh, speech enhancement is uh, aims to reconstruct the clean speech signal from the noisy mixture, right? And in, in the case, let's say that you had access to the energy distribution of the clean speech and the noise signal, you would be able, like the, the optimal thing to do is to use this, uh, the so-called Wiener filter, okay? And the Wiener filter has this very simple expression. And um, I'm insisting a bit on that because on what we will find in the following, we will find, let's say, more complex versions of this Wiener filter, right? So let us take just a minute to discuss it. You can see here that you recover, let's say, your clean speech signal um, from a coefficient times your uh, your noisy mixture vector, right? And if we take a closer look to this coefficient, and we imagine that the noise sing the noise power is very low compared to the signal power, uh, this fraction that you have here will tend to one, 
And therefore, your estimate is going to correspond to your observation. And this makes a lot of sense because we just said that the noise power is very low compared to the clean speech power. And on the opposite, if we think that at some point we will have a very high noise that will have a lot more power than the speech signal, what's going to happen is the diffraction is going to go to zero, right? And therefore, our clean speech estimate is going to be, go to zero as well. And this makes a lot of sense because if the noise is much, much, much powerful than the speech, well, then we rather say that we have absolutely no idea and we have put a zero, all right? So this final filtering is, is, is very intuitive. And as I said, we will find like similar expressions in the following. So please just uh, keep it in mind for the uh, first half of the talk. All right, so I promised you some um, unsupervised learning. And uh, the way we use this paradigm for uh, speech enhancement is that we start from a data set of uh, clean speech, right, that we can download um, from those that are available uh, in the net. And then we learn a probabilistic model for the clean speech. Signal. That's going to be this theta here. Once we have learned this model, we freeze it, right? And now the question is, how are we going to adapt to different kinds of noise that we can find at test time, all right? So the clean speech model is not going to move, but we will try to adapt to various kinds of noise, right? And to do so, we basically combine this um, model of the speech signal uh, that is now frozen with a model for the noise signal, right? And we say that the combination of these two models is going to produce the noisy speech signal X, which is what we are going to observe at test or adaptation time, all right? And now the point here is that at this point, what we will need to do is first learn the parameters of the noise uh, model, and once we have done that, we will be able to have an estimate of the clean speech signal. Very important here, we don't have samples of the noise directly. The only samples that we have not now are those of the noisy speech, right? But since we have a model for the clean speech we, that is frozen, we hope that we will be able to learn the parameters of the noise model and then to get an estimate of the clean speech. Um, all right, so how to include uh, visual information in this pipeline? As you probably imagine, um, if you don't know yet, this hopefully becomes very uh, intuitive, is that visual data, and in particular motion, can provide complementary information about the unknown speech. So in, uh, in cases where there is some acoustic noise, Right, um, having an image of the lip region can uh, provide additional clues to actually remove the noise and uh, let's say uh, enhance the speech signal with the right uh, phonemes, or at least the phonemes that can correspond to what you observe in the in those images. Right. Um, so what we would like to, to do and what we did like in the in the past few years is uh, investigate this uh, variational temporal framework to fuse auditory and visual data for speech enhancement and supervised speech enhancement. So the first uh, question is, can we actually do that? Like in, in a very simple manner, right? Is it helping? Uh, and this is uh, work that was led by uh, Mustafa and uh, in collaboration also with uh, Laurent and, and Rado here in Lona. So, um, whenever we are going to think about uh, multimodal VAE, the first and most important thing, or let's say in a multimodal problem, one question that you have to ask yourself is how does it compare to monomodal uh, problems, right? So these are going to be uh, many, many times your baselines or part of your baselines, right? So of course you can have an audio only um, VAE, right? So on basically a version of encoder that is trying to reconstruct the speed signal. Uh, from the speech signal, and you can have, let's say, a video only, uh, in quotes, in the sense that you reconstruct the audio signal from the video signal, all right? Uh, so these are going to be our two baselines. And then what we propose is to have a VAE that would input the video together with the audio at the, at, and the encoder, right? And at, at the reconstruction part or the decoder part, we will uh, get 
the sampling from the uh, latent variable as we usually do, and that will be concatenated again with the VDC, right? So um, the question that they have now is, what is this going to learn, right? And I will give a hint because this is maybe a bit too abstract. Uh, we are here trying to reconstruct the speech signal, giving at the input of my VAE, the same speech signal concatenated to one of the frames of the visual signal, right? And um, I cannot see your faces, so I don't know if you are completely puzzled or not by this question, but anyway, what's going to happen and what happens is that this architecture learns to ignore the video. Why? Because if your latent uh, code is um, has enough uh, dimensions, then all, all the information that you need to reconstruct the audio signal is in the very same audio signal, right? So there is no need for the network to go and exploit the visual information that you input both at the encoder and at the decoder. So to overcome this problem, um, what we propose are two things. First, uh, we propose to get away from the standard prior and propose a prior that is conditioned by the visual signal, right? So we call that a visual prior. Um, and then to enforce the network to reconstruct, to give, let's say, to have some reconstruction power from this visual prior, right? And we did it by modifying a little bit the evidence lower bound. So you have here a very huge formula. The black part is the standard evidence lower bound for a VAE. And what we have done is we have basically downscaled this a little bit, uh, multiplied by one minus alpha, and then add an additional term, which enforces a reconstruction, uh, so, to, so to give them some reconstruction power to the visual prime, right? With, of course, exactly the, the, the very same people. And this actually forces the network to pay attention to the video scene, okay? So uh, that is, my, let's say, my second uh, takeaway uh, on the fly is uh, be careful when you use uh, multiple modalities to actually have a network architecture or whatever model and the associated loss that would actually force to exploit the various modalities that you have in the input. Right? Otherwise, you are not really solving a problem in a multimodal way. All right, so um, uh, once we have learned this, now I'm recording a little bit the, our old framework, so we, we train uh, this audiovisual conditional VAE with audiovisual clean speech data. We obtain those parameters, we freeze them. And now at test time, we are going to combine this with a noise model. And then the point is to estimate the noise parameters and then to have an estimate right, of the clean speech signal. So I will skip um, the very long uh, mathematical derivations, and I will just um, show uh, here a formula for the estimate of the clean speech signal. And although it is a little bit more complex than the Wiener filtering that I showed before, it has a very similar structure. Indeed, if you take a look to each of the terms of this sum, each of them behaves as a mini Wiener filter, right? So. This is actually very reassuring when we obtain this uh, this kind of formulas because we are able to map it to some let's say standard uh, signal processing technique that tell us that uh, we are possibly in the in the right track. Okay. Uh, so it gives some sort of um, interpretability. Uh, let, let me put it that way. All right. So uh, we have. Evaluated this on the um, uh, MTCD TMID dataset, which is an uh, audiovisual speech dataset. Um, we have we have tried several types of noise, several levels of noise, and then we have evaluated this with three metrics, um, which are PESC, uh, the signal to distortion ratio, and the STOI. Um, all three metrics share that is the, the highest, uh, the higher the better. And these are improvements over the noisy mixture. So this means that these are not, let's say, absolute values, but the values that are compared to the noisy mixture, which is the, the let's say, not doing anything, right? And I'm saying this because we expect some sort of bell 
shaped curves here. And the reason is that when it is really noisy, it is very difficult to improve because the information is really corrupted. When it is not noisy at all, it is very difficult to improve as well because the signal is quite clean already. Okay, so it's in the in the middle there that that we will have the most improvement as shown in this course. So we have, of course, compared um, the audiovisual VAE that you can see here in turquoise uh, with the blue and the green curves, which are the audio only and the video only uh, VAEs, right? And what you can see is that uh, overall, you kind of get the best of both worlds um, on the audiovisual uh, VA, right? And if you want to hear some examples, you can go to our uh, web page, and then you have like a bunch of examples there, and you can and you can um, hear how good or bad we are able to uh, enhance the speed. Signal. So. Uh, one of the problems that this uh, of this model design is that that is we are systematically fusing audio and vision. Right, this is a concatenation, so it doesn't matter how good or bad are those signals, you are always fusing them via the concatenation. Right. So, in particular, whenever you have visual clutter like a microphone in front of the lips, hand motion that may um, occlude the mouth for a few frames. Um, you are giving this to your to your network, and therefore you are giving, let's say, the wrong visual pattern to the net, right? So then we ask ourselves, can we uh, select if we are going to use audio and or video in an unsupervised way? Because of course I don't want to annotate at every frame if I have to use one or the other. Right? So this is a follow-up work, and it was done uh, with uh, my colleague uh, Mustafa. The idea here is to use a mixing latent variable. This is pretty much like a, like a Gaussian mixture model where you have this um, uh, variable that assigns your observation to a cluster. So that's a, it's exactly the same kind of variable in the sense that now we are uh, assigning each of the vectors of the spectrogram either to an audio-only VAE or to an audio-visual VAE. Right? And if we had other options, like we could use like a video-only VAE maybe, and we could use some like we could, we could assign it to many different uh, models, but we kind of proved the interest of this model with these uh, two VAs, right? And um, the, the thing here is that this choice of using the, the blue one, which is the audio only, or the magenta one, which is the audio visual, it's done in an unsupervised way. Like the, this, the value of this mixing latent variable will be chosen again, just simply to maximize the log likelihood, right? Um, so that's, again, one of the advantages of using this uh, probabilistic formulation. So the way we do that is that we first train the audio VAE with clean speech and the audiovisual VAE with clean audiovisual speech, right? So you have these two models. Then um, we the, the two uh, clean speech, they become latent together with the mixing variable, which is also a latent variable. Uh, this is then combined with the noise, as, as we have seen before, uh, so that it provides basically the noisy, um, uh, the noisy uh, speeching, right? So, okay, there is a complicated algorithm to learn the parameters of the noise. And then uh, we define this gamma here that I I'd like to talk about before showing you the final result to estimate the clean speech. And you can see that this gamma here is basically a convex combination, uh, because this Pn goes between 0 and 1, a convex combination of the audio on the energy and the audiovisual energy, right? Uh, so it is some sort of an optimal combination of both representations, the audio only one and the audiovisual one. And then whenever you compute the uh, estimate for the speed signal, you obtain this very nice formula that you should now be used to, which is some sort of binner like um, um, formulation. Again, some of our uh, uh, few things that are binner like But now this gamma is not audio only or audio visual. It's the best possible combination between the, represent the audio only representation and the audio visual representation. So in a way, what we are doing is that 
for every frame uh, of the noisy spectrum Xn, we are selecting or inferring which is the best way to represent this uh, spectrogram. Um, and then uh, once we have done that, which is the best, uh, you know, where do you put the cursor, right? Uh, between zero and one. And once you have uh, understood that, then you compute this gamma, right? Which is the best weight, uh, weighted uh, energy. And then you use that uh, in a wiener like uh, formulation. So once again, this is very reassuring because we are obtaining a very reasonable and and somewhat interpretable uh, form. All right, so we have used uh, like the, the very same data set. Um, the, the only thing that we have changed is that we have uh, now compared it in a clean setup, which is the one as before, and in a noisy setup in which some of the uh, visual frames were corrupted with, um, uh, with noise, right? So on the clean setup, we see that we do not uh, obtain much advantage, right? So our VAEMM, which is this mixture of VAEs, is the turquoise score, which is compared to the audio only and to the audio visual, right? Blue and red respectively. And um, the thing is that you can see in the clean setup, it doesn't make much sense. Uh, why? Because, uh, well, you just use the audio visual VAE, which is your best shot, right? Because the visual, uh, input is not corrupt. However, when you corrupt the visual input, uh, then there are several things that are interesting here. Uh, the first one is that then the uh, uh, the, vis the audio visual VAE can actually uh, can actually basically uh, collapse, right? It, it goes down. It provides a very very bad result. Um, and and what is more interesting is that then the VAE mixture model. Then it really takes the best of the best of the two worlds, right? And this is pretty intuitive, actually, because we are unsupervisedly selecting which is the best combination of the two. So then it's it's actually doing sometimes even better than the two of them, right? Uh, so that was a very very nice reason. So all this is fine, but it poses a conceptual problem that actually no one uh, found out during the review process. So we were some, somewhat lucky. And the conceptual problem is that now I have two VAEs that are supposed to model exactly the same speech signal, right? So if they are supposed to model exactly the same speech signal, then why do I have two different decoders? The decoder is supposed to approximate my data distribution. Right, so if it's the same data distribution, well, I should have only a single decoder, right? So that's exactly what we have proposed as a follow-up of this work, and I'm not gonna uh, give many details. Just let me um, show the three um, the three um, architectures. So the first one is the conditional VAE, is the one that we discussed first, right? That is inputting video uh, at the encoder and at the decoder. Then we have the VA mixture model, which is basically picking up the best combination between the audio only VAE and the audio visual VAE in an unsupervised way. And then what we call the mixture of inferent networks VAE or the mean VAE is uh, actually exploiting this um, mixing variable, but at encoder time, right? So basically we train first the uh, um, audio only VAE, we keep the encoder, then we train the video only VAE, we keep the encoder, and then we, we fine tune these encoders at the same time that we train the decoder of the mean VA, right? Um, okay, and then this uh, has even better results than the VA mixture model. So these VAEs are wonderful for, uh, for uh, modeling uh, data distributions and they are, uh, good for to mix with other kinds of probabilistic models. The issue, which is actually quite a strong limitation, is that they process frames independently, right? Um, this is a problem because, of course, a speed signal is a sequential signal. So uh, we would like to have, if possible, some VAE-like models, but that they are able to uh, process sequences of it, right? So we took a look to the literature, and of course, there were a few models that were doing that. Um, and we unified them in a, in a review, uh, 
in a review paper that we published at Foundations and Trends in Machine Learning. Uh, and this was done, of course, in collaboration with uh, a, a few people because it's a, it's a huge effort. So Xiaoyu uh, was our PhD student that's now a postdoc at uh, Telecom in uh, Paris. Uh, then Laurent, Simon, Thomas, and uh, Julien. And uh, if you want to read that, just, I mean, of course, you're invited to do that, but take it easily because the paper is, I think, like 150 pages long. Uh, so uh, unless um, you are an exceptional, wonderful mind, it might take some time to digest. Um, so the idea here is that instead of modeling the the different frame, frames of the spectrogram or whatever sequential signal that you have as uh, independent and identically distributed, you model them jointly in, uh, in a distribution that takes the whole sequence into account, right? So from a, from a generative perspective, uh, you can imagine that you start with the first latent variable, you generate the first observed variable. That's exactly what a VAE does. But then you take these two into account to generate the next latent variable, right? This is something that the VAE does not. Uh, and then so forth and so on, you can keep on generating both latent and observed variables um, from the, all the previous history, right? Uh, so in, when you write this mathematically, it's a little bit more cumbersome, but this is just, let's say, the formal uh, expression of what I just said with words. And uh, there are two important things here. The first is that the prior distribution of Z is not like this standard Gaussian anymore because it might depend on previous Zs and X, okay? Um, that's one first thing. And then the second thing is that both the, what is called the, what was called before the prior distribution and the, uh, the likelihood, they might be, let's say, autoregressive or they might be, uh, like they have um, uh, Markovian dependencies, right? So basically they take a look to the past, right? Um, so I would like to mention a few things that are important for these dynamical relational encoders or DVAEs. This is again, some sort of summary of this 150 page long paper. So um, it's going to be maybe a, just a quick overview. Uh, one first question is now you have to, of course, decide how do you approximate the posterior distribution. You will never be able to use it exactly as in a VAE, so you have to approximate. But here the question is all these, all these sequence of latent variables z1 to t, what are the dependencies between these variables and between these variables and the observation? So to, to do that formally, you need to take a look to what is called the separation and to see if some of the terms of these dependencies, some of, some of these probabilistic dependencies can be actually dropped or, you know, in a way, if this probabilistic model can be simplified, right? Um, so there might be reasons to simplify even, even further, like for instance, to have a causal, a causal inference model, but I would recommend that you uh, go first to this separation step, and then if you need to simplify further, that's okay, but at least you know that you're simplifying further your model, right? A second point is on the implementation. So you are now uh, considering models, if you use these DBAEs, that will accumulate information over time. So of course, uh, you can use, uh, of course, RNNs, right? But you can use any other mechanism, transformers, whatever, that allows you to accumulate information over time. And each of these choices is going to be an implementation choice that you can do, you can do both for the encoder or for the decoder, right? And this is going to have practical implications in your probabilistic model. So you cannot just say, okay, this is my probabilistic model. It doesn't matter how we implement it. You have to be careful on how do you, you are going to implement this model, right? And if you are interested into this implementation um, um, uh, issues or considerations, I would uh, highly encourage you to take a look to the GitHub of uh, Xiaoyu. Uh, and then you have, I think, at least nine different DVAEs that are implemented. And you can just play with them um, in PyTorch uh, very, very easily. So yeah, it's, it's also a great way to, uh, a great way to 
delve into these kind of models that for, for some of you might be easier than the equations. Not definitely my case, but for some of you, it might be the case. So go ahead and check this GitHub. And then the final uh, thing that you have to be careful about is the learning. Uh, so uh, as in the case of VAEs, and I'm skipping a few details here, you use the uh, evidence lower bound, right? And the evidence lower bound has these two terms, or reconstruction and the regularization. So of course, now we are considering a sequence. So uh, one thing that is going to happen is that you are going to have the sum of these two terms over the sequence. That's why you have a sum over T, both for the reconstruction and regularization term. But another thing that happens when you write this uh, and, and you want to be, let's say, precise mathematically is now your expectation has to be taken with respect to all previous latent variables set as well, okay? So this means that for some of these models, you have to do sequential sampling, right? So you have to sample Z1, then Z2, then Z3, then Z4, and so on. So the parallelization of this becomes actually a challenge, right? That might actually be another reason for which you want to uh, simplify your inference model, right? But this is a different consideration. All right. so. Um, we have, of course, applied this to um, uh, unsupervised speech enhancement. This is going to be audio only, but it's the same principle, right? So we start with a model uh, that has uh, like clean speech to train now one of these dynamical variational decoders. Once it is trained, we freeze the parameters of this model, and then we combine it with a noise model so that uh, then we can uh, learn the parameters of the noise and then hopefully get an, um, uh, an estimate of the clean speed signal. Okay? So I will uh, give you just a summary of the results. Uh, this was uh, published with uh, Xiaoyu at Transactions and Audio um, Single, uh, sorry, Audio, Audio Speech and Language Processing uh, a year ago. And the, the original results table is actually quite, quite, quite long um, and, and difficult to read. So I here present a summary. Uh, we are comparing here uh, two unsupervised methods that you can find in green with one, let's say, um, semi-supervised method, let's put it that way, in orange and two um, uh, supervised methods in red, okay? So we tried this in uh, two different data sets. Um, and then on when the test and train and test data sets are the same, we see that the unsupervised gets uh, comparable performance either with the supervised or the uh, semi-supervised, which is also a very good, <coughs> sorry, uh, a very good achievement uh, because the difference is that we have no idea about the noise uh, distribution, while semi-supervised and supervised methods have seen actually the noise distribution. So achieving a similar performance is actually very good. But when we switch the speech data set, that's very interesting because we can see that the supervised and semi-supervised methods drop significantly, while the um, unsupervised, either they drop a little bit or sometimes they even increase a little bit, right? So basically, they globally they maintain like a reasonably similar performance. All right. So this um, actually is a very good uh, result for us, and uh, this is um, we are convinced that uh, this is a very good, let's say, global paradigm to address uh, problems where the data distribution can actually change from trying to test, right? And then you need to adapt to a new distribution. So, uh, so far, uh, all the DBAs that I mentioned um, were implemented via RNN. So obviously a question had to be asked, can we implement uh, DBAs with uh, transformer architectures? This is joint work with uh, two busy students, show you on when, uh, and then uh, three colleagues, Simon uh, Francesc in Barcelona and uh, Laurent. So, um, we had proposed a, an architecture that we called hierarchical transformer DBAE or heat DBAE that has one static latent variable, this W, 
And one dynamic one in the sense that it has as many latent variables as a sequence, so it's a sequence of latent variables, right? Um, and uh, we had studied, uh, so we have like a, basically a transformer architecture both in the encoder and in the decoder. But if you take a closer look on how this is implemented here, it's kind of a little bit odd the way this uh, query keys and values are used. So traditionally, you query, uh, uh, so the, the queries in your transformer are, let's say, the same signal that you want to decode at the output, right? While in here, you see that this Q, it's like cross, right? So when you want to decode X, you query with Z. When you want to uh, decode Z, you query with X. So that is a little bit strange, but it is made on purpose. And I will try to explain why uh, in the follow. Um, before that, let me just um, explain what task we were dealing with here, which was um, human uh, motion modeling and generation. And we have actually proven in another article that um, predicting uh, the pose at time O plus one from the past it's actually very easy. Why? Because usually these are like high frame rate, like 30 frames per second, and we don't move that fast, right? So it's fairly easy to predict just the next step. So what happens is that in the standard, um, um, in the standard formulation of transformers, the query is the same one that has the, the, the same value that has a residual connection, right? And if you think about it, uh, it doesn't matter how many layers of the transformer you have, you have always this residual connection that is going up and up and up and up and up and up. And because XO plus one is very similar to XO, basically this residual connection is doing 90% of the work, okay? So you don't learn much, and then when you want to generalize, things collapse a little. That has nothing to do with probabilistic methods, by the way. It's just a matter of the architecture. So what we have to propose is to have a slightly different, um, uh, a slightly different architecture where the query and the residual connection would actually come from the encoder, right? Instead uh, than uh, the decoder itself, right? Instead than instead of the same uh, signal that you want to to decode, and this means that the work ninety percent of the work now cannot be done by this residual connection, and you are forcing the attention mechanism to uh, work properly and to learn how to work, properly. all right? So that's the reason why in the previous figure, you had this, let's say, weird cross connections between um, uh, Z and X. So uh, once we've done that, so we can learn again, uh, maximizing the uh, evidence level bound. Um, and we have shown that uh, we have quite compatible performance with the uh, state of the art, all right? Uh, we have also shown that it can be useful for audio modeling, as in this uh, year's uh, ICAST paper with uh, Show You. All right. So I have um, promised you audiovisual stuff. And for a while, I am talking about DBAEs, but without uh, like in a single, single modality framework. Uh, of course, we have tried that uh, for multiple modalities with uh, Samir, or Simon, Renaud, and Laurent. And uh, uh, the idea is, uh, okay, you have uh, VAEs, you have, there can be multimodal, so can DVAEs be multimodal too? And to actually showcase that they can, we have used this uh, audiovisual speech data set. And in this data set, you have a few things that are, uh, that should be modeled because they can vary. So uh, one of them uh, is the ID of the person or the emotion. And these are some, some kind of static properties of the, of the small uh, audiovisual sequence that we input to, the, to, the, uh, to our method. We have also dynamic audiovisual uh, latent variables that are those that correlate the lead movements with the speed signal. And then we have dynamic monomodal latent variables, uh, which are audio and video. And these correspond to all the audio and video content that is not correlated um, 
that is not correlated with the other one, right? So for instance, just to give a concrete example, um, you have the A action units, right? In the, in the video side. And these are of course not correlated to the audio thing, right? Uh, so these have to be modeled only on the video side, right? It happens the same with the audio. Some uh, speech production related uh, features are not correlated to the lips, right? So they shouldn't be in the in the second uh, bullet point, but they, have, they should have like a variable on their own. Um, so that's how we that's how our, our model looks like. Uh, in the middle, you have these green variables that are audiovisual. You have the static one in the bottom, this W. Again, this models the emotion or the identity. Then you have the uh, dynamic audiovisual latent variable. And then left and right, you have uh, audio and video. On top, you have the latent variables that are filled with blue or red, respectively. And uh, in the bottom, you have the observations, X, uh, that are also, I mean, they are basically the sounds and the image, right? Um, so we refer to that as the multimodal DVAE, so MDVAE, and that was recently accepted at uh, Middle Methods. We actually learned that in combination with monomodal VQVAEs um, because they provided, uh, say, better results, right? So we first learned the VQVAEs independently, one for audio, one for video, and then on that latent space, that's where we learn our multimodal DVA, right? So it's a combination of these two things. Uh, and I wanted to show uh, uh, maybe one video, because I think we are kind of running a bit out of time. So let me show this video here. Uh, and in this video, uh, what we are basically showing is that if we extract the W, um, uh, from the left uh, sequence and the W from the right sequence, then we can interpolate in between these two Ws, right? And then generate whatever sequence uh, is with um, uh, with this interpolated W, right? So once again, and I insisted on that, uh, this gives some hope for uh, interpretability, right? So there is some sort of disentanglement happening because we have chosen to model with a static audiovisual variable, a dynamic audiovisual variable, and all these different variables actually encode different things. And they correspond to an intuition of the problem that we have uh, beforehand. All right. So uh, the last thing I wanted to discuss before we come to the conclusions um, is that in the case of VAEs, uh, beyond showing you that uh, we could use multimodality, we have I have also showed you that we could combine this with other probabilistic uh, mechanisms, such as the mixing variable, right? Another question is, is it possible to do this with the VAEs or how useful it is and, and to do what? Um, so this is uh, this was very recently accepted with to transactions of machine learning research and it's joint work with uh, Xiao Yu and uh, Laurent. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna give more the intuition than, than the exact formulation because it is a little bit, um, uh, let's say, equation heavy. So you can imagine that our problem is, we have three tracklets. Um, so three things that have been tracked until time t minus one. Now I detect some objects at time t, and now what I would like to do is assign these objects to those tracklets and then update uh, the value of the latent bug, right? Um, so now we have here two things, two kinds of latent variables at least, which is the position, right? The update of the tracklet, but then you also have this assignment variable, right? To, that tells me which detection is associated to which source, all right? And this is where the mixing mechanism will actually play an important role. Um, so uh, the way this works for us is that we have, let's say, pre-trained offline one of these uh, DVAs, and then we receive this input, right? The tracklets with those three colors and the detections. The first thing that we do is we input each of the tracklets to the DVAE, and then the DVAE somehow predicts 
where are the tractors going to be in the next time step. Thanks to this prediction, the mixed DBA algorithm will that inputs also the detections will actually be able to somehow compute the assignments and update this um, this position, right? So uh, these are two E steps, let's say. <coughs> Sorry. And that this will provide me, uh, let's say, the updated version of the um, of the source positions. This is the inference step, but we could complete that with some learning step. And we could actually back propagate again by maximizing the elbow. And this, for instance, we could back propagate the noise model of the detections, or we could also back propagate to fine tune the uh, parameters of the DBA, right? So I just want to, again, to rework a little bit on this interpretability. I'm showing here um, how the mean of a GMM is updated, right? This is, let's say, a standard formula. You have these assignments here, this eta k n, um, and that tell me if the source k is assigned, sorry, if the observation k is assigned to the source n, right? So that's how the centroid of a GMM cluster is updated. Now here I showed the, what is called the Kalman update, right? And the Kalman update is telling me you have a, um, you have the position at time t minus one, you predict the position at time t, and then you update this prediction with the current observation. Okay. So what the, with this mixed DBA is doing is actually taking all the past values of the uh, source position and have a nonlinear prediction, and then have this uh, assignment as in a GMM to compute the update, all right? So in, in the mixed DBAE, the update of the source position is a combination of several assignments at time t as in the case of a GMM, plus the prediction that you had from the previous time steps, all right? So mapping our, our formula, right, that what we obtain to uh, standard update techniques like the Kalman or the GMM is also actually quite uh, reassuring, right? It makes sense. Um, so this is still work in progress. There are many, many challenges. So if you're interested in, in, in things like this, uh, please drop an email and then we can discuss for you. So just a summary of what we have presented so far. Um, uh, we started with, uh, let's say, static BAEs, like or, or frame-based BAEs, uh, monomodal ones. Um, we went, we proposed a few uh, multimodal extensions of that, in particular working with mixtures, right? We then moved to the uh, uh, dynamic version of the BAE with uh, the review on the BAEs and the switching BAEs that I didn't have time to present. We have also shown that with this, this VQM DBA that you can actually use this for uh, for multimodal processing, and um, we we have also shown that the mixture uh, mechanism can also be used with uh, dynamic variation of the Right. So this is an overall picture, and of course there are many other methods in the literature that you could that you could fit here, right? Um, so as, as a bunch of uh, conclusions and, and future work, I would uh, really like to send this message, uh, you know, don't be afraid of these probabilistic models. They really provide you interpretability in, in, in different ways um, in terms of uh, disentanglement, but also in terms of learning, uh, uh, you know, comparing the results, the, the, the formulas that you obtain with standard techniques. Um, it, it also gives you the opportunity to mix uh, recent models, uh, VQV, VAE, VQVAE, even diffusion models with more classical ones in the same probabilistic paradigm. That's super interesting. Um, and, and, and this is exactly this maximum blending paradigm that provides this principal way of um, learning inference, disentanglement representation, and actually interpreting those representations. There are, of course, many open questions that relate to complexity uh, because these evo involve iterative algorithms like EM, VEM. Um, how to extend this to other modalities is also a question. And then uh, how to, uh, yeah, as I said, mix this with other families um, can also be something to uh, discuss.
So just a, a small advertisement slide. Uh, we are organizing a winter school in February on social robotics, artificial intelligence, and multimedia. You can see here the, uh, the speakers. So there is no fee uh, associated to the school. So if you are interested, please uh, register. And uh, we can even uh, fund, uh, we have some travel funding for um, uh, people from uh, underrepresented countries. So having said that, I would like to thank everyone for uh, bearing with me. Of course, my colleagues, uh, my collaborators and the funding agencies and uh, in advance for your challenging questions and hopefully interesting discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Xavi. So uh, as usual, uh, I was always joking saying that you are excited with uh, with the mathematics and uh, and things. So I think it's quite uh, quite nice as usual. Um, <laughs> if uh, guys, if you have questions, uh, please raise your hand, and uh, well, we can uh, we can ask uh, Xavi directly. Yes, you can also write them on the chat. I have it write them on the chat, and I can uh, I can uh, I can read them. Uh, well, not yet. Uh, let me ask, um, start with the question, because I think it's, uh, so I would, I would start from the very end. So the fact that, um, so I completely agree that having these probabilistic models and combining them with the new approaches really brings you a lot of things like, you know, explainability and the modularity and a lot of other things. Um, I was, I, I'm just curious, you know, since you talk about multimodality and so on. So nowadays, of course, the foundation models are very popular. So have you considered kind of combining these with some foundation models in some ways? Yeah, so obviously, yeah, th thanks for the question, Nico. Uh, we are obviously uh, taking a look to that. Um, there, are, there are things that could be um, actually done uh, by these foundation models, but there are other things that I think it will be very difficult. So, mm -hmm. and, and the main reason for that is, uh, as, as we all know, training these models requires a lot of data. Yes. So in situations or like tasks for which you need, uh, it's difficult to gather this uh, large amount of data, then it's going to be difficult to train a foundation model to, to address this task. Um, like for instance, maybe to build an audiovisual representation of speech, Mm -hmm. Maybe that, that could be done right, with a foundation model. That, that is possible. But now, whenever you have to decide whether the speech that you are hearing belongs to uh, you know, person A or person B, uh, that is a bit more difficult because it means that you would need some sort of annotation of this to train yes, your... Yes, of course. Um, so that's why I'm not losing uh, hope completely on, on those uh, pro-existing models. But they will definitely be a, a huge... Uh, let's say uh, they will bring a lot of representation power in uh, in, in in our framework for sure. Yes, yeah, especially also when uh, let's say the whatever the input it's not so it's kind of ambiguous in some ways. Yes, in your case, if you want to detect which speak which is a speaker, then it's, it's yes probably you need to to look at, at the data you have right. So you need annotation and so on. But uh, if you want to uh, to kind of maybe indicate, uh, maybe even, even using text, some sort of information or some sort of relation that you would have between, let's say, audio and vision information, this could also be, uh, be useful, right? Because in some cases, of course, the audio and the visual information may be ambiguous or maybe contradictory and so on. So probably having some extra information, extra control could also help. Yes, yes, definitely. And also having a sort of some sort of summary of what happened in the scene over the past uh, yes. say 15 seconds. That that should be very helpful to to disambiguate and, and to, to create a richer representation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, another curiosity that I have, and then I will let people, so please guys uh, think of uh, putting some, um, some questions. Um, another thing that is to me is quite interesting, it's what you indicated the connection with, let's say, with flows. This means that you somehow want to incorporate some physical models into, uh, let's say, into your uh, your uh, uh, VIEs and so on. Have you thought about it? How how do you want to do this? Um, what do you mean by physical models? Uh, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, you had uh, you had the relationship to diffusion models and then to flows, right? So uh, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by flows there. Oh, I I meant uh, normalizing flows. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What were you thinking of? 
No, because I was thinking, so for example, you can uh, you can have uh, the latent space, for example, you can yeah. consider it, especially when you do generation, but here you don't really do, but you can have the latent space, uh, the latent space be modeled like a flow. So we had some recent paper in uh, in Eurips, uh, on on trying to have uh, to have flows and try to model the uh, the the latent space as the flow, and then from there you can have some sort of let's say equations that that could probably uh, be incorporated or be similar to to what you have with the VAEs. Oh, okay. I'll take a look to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's it's a work done. I mean, okay, you saw I saw the, the relation to 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 the to the original VAE. It's a work done with uh, with Max Welling. Okay. So it's um it's it's quite uh, it's quite interesting into that. Okay, okay. I'll take a look at that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So there is some question from um, uh, Marco Paladino. Paladino. Uh -huh. So you mentioned this separation to simplify the procedure distribution after rewriting it with Bayes' theorem. You you then mentioned causality. Can you give us an example of usage of causal information in your work? Would it be possible to use the DVA to infer causality on your data? Oh, okay. So first I see that um, there is a, an, a disambiguation to make for the word causal. So when I meant causal, I mean causal in a temporal sense, uh, right? So let me try to get back to that. Um, where was it? Uh, yeah, I should actually be more precise about that next time. So um, what, what, what happens uh, is that, uh, I hope you can see my mouse. Yes. Um, it, this distribution here, see, it depends on past and future observations, right? One to capital D. So this means that your inference model has to see the entire sequence to actually estimate the posterior distribution. Um, this is bad, for instance, in tracking, right? If, if, if you have the entire sequence, then it's much easier, right? But most of the times you want to have an online tracking in the sense that at time T, you want to have a decision at time T. You don't want to wait until the end of the sequence to take a decision, right? So I, Causality meant is meant in that sense. Non, non. I think it's a different sense on, on what you are uh, mentioning here. I think. So it was simplification in the sense that even if uh, this separation tells you that your posterior depends on all the observations, you say, okay, whatever. I cut it out because I want an online model, right? So, uh, yes. Okay. So this answered the question, I guess. Right. Yes, but I mean, can you uh, use into your model also to do some prediction, for example? Uh, yeah, prediction, yes. But I, I think Marco was referring to. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But that's that's uh, that's something you know extra, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no, yeah, yeah. Of course, we can we can uh, predict, like for instance, for the um, for the um, for this uh, task. I mean, mm -hmm. here we were predicting the uh, the future poses, right? We were exactly. basically start having. Uh, the the input was until time uh, t right or o whatever and then we would predict or generate the future of that right mm -hmm. yes yes, yeah, yes absolutely okay some other question uh i do have a question can you hear me okay yes yes please go okay ahead. uh thank you for the presentation uh i, I do have a question because uh, on the i think it was the paper on the multimodal dynamical via uh, you are using Unimodal VQ VIA. Yes. And I wanted to ask, uh, I mean, open question on how and uh, uh, are VQ VIA better in which cases? And is there any intuition on how um, they work well in this uh, variational case uh, and multimodal case as well? Uh, okay, so let me. Let, let me try to understand if I understood your question. So um, here, I mean, you mentioned that the VQVAs are monomodal, which yeah. is true. Let's say we have two VQVAs, one audio, one video. The reason we have this is that we want to use this to then learn the multimodal DVA. Mm. So what I'm trying to say is that if I learn a multimodal VQVA, then my representation is already audiovisual. So then it's going to be more difficult to 
split this and is an audio only, uh, video only, audio visual later variable, right? So that's the reason we have learned monomodal VQVAs. Hmm. And then for the other part, I, I, I'm not sure that I understood. I, I, I was quite confused. Uh, my, my, my question was mostly why are you using a vector quantized version? Why not continuous VIA or what, what is the intuition uh, behind the... Oh, uh, okay, okay. That That is, um, I, I think it's a matter of... Um, um, it, it's a matter of performance in the sense that then this MDVA that you see in the middle, it's easier to learn in that other space, okay? Rather than if you use a VA. But but uh, it, I think it's just a matter of, uh, you know, learning better. It's it's not, um, it should be, we should be able to learn it also in the continuous space, but I think it's just more difficult. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for, for your answer. Oh. Okay. Any other question? Okay, there is uh, another question mm -hmm. from um, John. Yes, so in the C, in the conditional VA, how are we sure that the spectrogram frame, which represents a few milliseconds, corresponds to one video frame, although we match the frame rate to the two modalities? Uh, well, actually, that's what we do. Like we have the same frame rate. We pick up, let me find the spectrogram. Um, we pick up the parameters of the short time Fourier transform so that um, the, 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 like one of these frames would correspond to one video signal. That, that's one way of answering that. But I don't know if you are asking me, if, how do I know if the physical phenomena that I observe in the video signal corresponds to the physical phenomena that I hear in the audio signal. These are things that, that, that is what I'm asking. That, that's a question, right? Okay. So I, I would say that I cannot ensure that 100%, uh, I mean, for 100% of the frames, it might happen that sometimes the um, there is a there is a delay and that delays happen in between two frames, right? So that could happen. Um, but I think that uh, it, it is not, yeah, it, it's not a problem in many cases. So actually this would be outliers that are basically learned out by the network. Does it make sense? Okay, okay, thank you. Um, but do you need well, to do to some me... sort of, uh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Uh... I want to ask uh, why do we consider a model? Uh, why do we model frame by frame instead of uh, the, instead of using directly the whole spectrogram like we can do for images in the in a VAE for image? Why why we consider frame by frame? I know that we you have talked about the sequential aspect, but why at Initial step. Your initial step is to consider frame by frame, uh, frame by frame, instead of the uh, whole spectrogram directly. Um, uh, I I think that the advantage of that is then uh, at test time you can test with uh, sentences of different lengths, uh, which is one very nice property. I would say it gives you some flexibility. If you learn a an architecture that um, is. Uh, is convolutional on the spectrogram. It means that you are limiting this to a certain size of the spectrogram, yeah. right? So in a way, this is this seems to me uh, quite artificial, right? Because you are saying that you okay, you are going to process sentences of one second, end of the story, right? Uh, while if you do that frame by frame, then you can do one frame after the other um, without any artificial cut in there, right? Uh, more than the spectrogram cut. Um, that's one thing, but I think that the right answer to that is uh, actually this is an artificial, what um, let's say, uh, choice, whether you do it frame by frame or image by image in the sense of a bunch of spectrum frames. The, the right answer to that is to do it in a sequential modeling way so that then you really can process a sequence of whatever length you want. Okay, thanks. Yes. Okay. Well, let's, uh, given that it's 6.20, well, uh, 
let's uh thanks Xavi. thanks a lot for uh, for your wonderful talk and uh well happy holidays and uh, well thank you all and uh, well see you next year and Xavi, we will stay in touch Yes, yes, yes. Thanks, Nico, for the invitation again. And it was nice uh, hearing all your uh, questions and comments. And I will definitely, uh, this, this is food for thought for sure. For sure. Excellent. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.